Um, all right. So I'm just going to do all the official things anyway. I can't remember if I'm supposed to do that or not without a quorum. But all right. Pursuant to the chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 this meeting will be conducted via remote means members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via zoom or by telephone no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means um so it is 6 34 i'm calling us to order um, although I'm not sure that we're a meeting technically, but we are here. We are a meeting though. It is a meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we can meet. We can we meet. Can. Like we're just again, yeah. we can yeah. Okay. Just so we can't vote. Can't vote. All right. So we have we all heard everybody and everybody heard each other, correct? Because Everald has spoken and De Deborah has spoken and Camille has spoken. Um we have announcements, um, approval of minutes. I'm going to move member reports up above public comment because I feel like that's usually how we do it. Public comment, um, action discussion items include, include CRESS update, DEI update, Resident Oversight Board and Youth Empowerment Center, and then upcoming agenda items and meeting schedules and any other topics not reasonably anticipated. Um, so does anybody have an announcement? I have some announcements. Um, it's just announcements that uh, of different like Juneteenth events going on in, in the area. Um, so June 15th, beginning at 11 a.m., there's a Juneteenth Legacy Celebration, Change to Change, honoring Amherst Everyday Heroes, walking tours beginning at 11 a.m., Story Slam at the Drake at 7 p.m., um, downtown Amherst. Uh, June 15th, at from 3 to 6 p.m., Juneteenth Celebration, community music vendors sponsored again by the Town of Amherst and the Human Rights Commission. Um, South Amherst Common, but I think that's supposed to be actually Mill River, I think, isn't it? I'm not too sure, but over here it says South Amherst Common. Then um, June 19th at 3 p.m. Um, oh no, that's in, in, in another area. So let me see. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. June 19th, um, 6 to 8.30 p.m. at 80 Acres, Juneteenth Gala community they're having a liberation in our time uh, performances award ceremony special announcement dinner provided and you have to rsvp to anthony at 80 acres.org by june 14th and that's going to be at the amherst public house 40 university drive um and then before then there is um another juneteenth celebration at mill river on june 19th i believe it's from one to four um, and that's by the BBAA, -A, um, Black Businesses uh, of Amherst area. And they're having a slew of activities and, um, you know, food and music and so on and so forth at Mill River. Um, and then June 19th at 7 p.m., there's going to be a Love and Basketball free screening for Juneteenth at Amherst Cinema. And then I guess the other one that we just received right from the uh, Women League is that they're going to have a reception for you, right, Camille? You and yes. um, Chief Ting on June 30th, um, the Amherst League of Women Voters. Where is that happening? Oh, Mill River, Mill River Rec area from 2.30 to 4.30. Um, I'm going to be out of town and we'll be able to attend, but I just wanted to announce that and so I think I got all the announcements so lots going on and there's a weird little sun in my <laughs> face <laughs> Everell do you have any announcements I do not thank you okay. mm -hmm. um and I think Deborah covered everything that I would have announced um and I don't think we have any minutes to review. That reminds me, I will try. Oh, I think Lisette was going to take the minutes last time. Um, I will 
try and take notes today. And we also have the backup of the recording. Um, so then we can move along to member reports. So again, yeah, I want to do a member report. Um, I just want to give an update to um, everyone on this um, meeting and also for anyone listening in that um, my uh, term for sitting at this in the CSSJC actually comes to the end on the end of June. And I started um, communicating with Paul Bachman back in March. Um, asking him to reappoint me to CSSJC. Um, Paul is the, is the town manager who appoints um, members to um, committees. And um, so Paul at that point had said that he was going to be looking at appointments and then getting back to me. And then I got in touch with him again last week um, a few times and then earlier this week to ask that I hadn't heard back. And obviously my appointment's coming to an end end of June uh, and didn't hear anything. And then I received an email from him saying that he was not going to be reappointing me. And that um, because since I, I served on CSWG and now I've served on CSSJC, and usually he only um, uh, appoints people to two terms. Um, and so, but he said I could continue on um, until he finds my replacement. So obviously I found that very odd. Um, and I have since uh, responded to him and said that, you know, I don't think that that is correct uh, because um, when I served on CSWG, that was a working group. That was the name of it, Community Safety Working Group. It was not a, com it was not a committee. So by his um, definition of two terms, I've only served one term on CSSJC, which is a committee. Um, and so... Uh, you know, that was very um, confusing to me. Um, and I also said that, you know, I'm aware of other committee members that have served more than two terms um, and that have served for years on, on certain committees. Um, and so I hadn't heard from him. And then I've already communicated with community members. Um, so a variety of community members. And thank you, Everell. Everell also sent him an email of support. Um, have has emailed Paul, have they've emailed Lynn, they've emailed uh, the town council. Some of these community members are town council members who have contacted Paul Bachman to let him know of my service, uh, of the fact that I am um, someone that advocates very zealously um, with lots of energy for uh, BIPOC community members, for equity, for social justice, for all members of Amherst community. And... Um, and that obviously this, this type of um, communication and lack of clarity as to why I'm not being reappointed um, for a second term doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, and I have, you know, Lynn has responded and said that she was going to be looking into it. Um, a lot of community members have gone back and touched with me and said that they have communicated with Paul Bachman. Um And I've also... Um, put in a public records request, requesting all information relevant to um, how the town appoints committee members, um, you know, what's the rules, the policies, practices, uh, procedures in regards to it, um, what are all the committees, com committee member names, duration of their terms uh, for the, for the um, past 10 years, um, so that then I can get a sense of um, what actually has been the track record for the town. Um, so since all of this has happened, I did receive a message from Paul stating that he is going to clarify his position and stating that, um, you know, wanting to make it clear that I can continue to serve on CSSJC uh, for now and that I am still considered a full member until he looks at the appointments and then he will get back to me. So at least I can, I can serve for the next few months. Um, which again, you know, CSSJC has two vacancies right now. So if I was to be gone, there would be three vacancies and the committee wouldn't even be able to, to, to work. So it, again, very confusing, doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so I haven't responded to Paul. I will be responding to him again that, yes, that's good. I can continue on, but I do want the communication as to whether I am appointed for the two-year term. 
uh, which is I do not want to be in this limbo situation of I can serve for the next few months. I don't know what that means. That doesn't tell me much. So um, that's where things are at as of right now. Um, again, I don't know why someone would want someone like myself who has been <laughs> advocating for people in the community um, and, and you know, is a responsible person, shows up faithfully to every meeting, um, you know, give voice to the voiceless and everything else is now being pushed out uh, of a committee when we know that this is a volunteer petition. There's many people that can't do this, especially people of color, people that look like me, that can't, you know, that don't have the time and they can't do it because of all of the duties that they have. And I do too. I'm a single mom with kids with um, caregiving responsibilities at home with a mom that's elderly. And yet I choose to be here every month to do this work and to do the work in between. Um, and for him to make a decision like this really feels personal, um, you know, does not feel good. Uh, and I'll just name it, it feels retaliatory in terms of the fact that I name things that go on in this town uh, and I'm not afraid to do it. I'm, I, I name it, I say it, and I'm gonna continue to do it. Um, whether I serve in CSSGC or whether I serve on other committees or whether I start calling in on public comment every day. So if, if Paula others think that by pushing me out of CSSJC, they're gonna silence me, that's not happening. Um, but uh, hopefully we can work this out and he will see his way to um, appointing me for the two years. So that's my um, member report. Well, thank you for the update, Deborah. And I certainly think that this committee runs well because of your leadership. So you're a great asset to the town and to this committee. And I hope that he will reappoint you for a full term. And Allegra, thank you too for your support that as you sent in a very um, key uh, email to Paul. And obviously you continue to be a wonderful co-chair with me. So thank you again for everything that you do. Um, I do also have an update about um, the arrests that occurred at UMass uh, in May and Amherst Police's um, official position on their involvement. Um, I had reached out to Paul shortly after the arrests occurred because community members had reached out to me saying that they were concerned about um, some of the level of brutality that they had observed or people around them had observed while they were at UMass at the protest um, for Gaza on May 7th. And they were concerned that APD was involved in making arrests. Um, so I did ask Paul for some clarification. So I'm just gonna read the email that he sent me. Um, he says, Here's a summary of the town police department's response to the request for mutual aid from the university. On the afternoon of May 7th, the Amherst Police Department received a request from the University of Massachusetts Police Department to use the APD's transport van. And the APD provided that vehicle to UMPD. No staff were provided and UMPD were responsible for driving the vehicle. PVTA also provided a vehicle. At approximately 9 p.m., UMPD requested mutual aid from Northampton Police, Hadley Police, and APD. APD reviewed its staffing to determine what assistance APD could provide. Six officers were called into duty, working three to four hours each. In addition, four shift officers were held over for an additional hour from midnight to 1 a.m. These officers drove in APD vehicles and parked in Lot 71. The vehicles were not used otherwise. APD's duties were to staff a safety perimeter. APD was not involved in any of the arrests. No other APD resources were utilized other than the transport van. APD officers remained in place in their perimeter assignments until approximately 12.45 a.m., at which time all officers were dismissed. So that is the official statement from the town on APD's involvement on May 7th. Um, so 
there we have that. I know that we're supposed to meet with um, Chief Ting next meeting, right? Correct. So is this something that we can ask him more about, more details? Because this doesn't provide us a lot of details. The statement I, that you read? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so I think we need to add that to the agenda for, for the next time. So that we can get more details because, you know, although the statement provides some information, I don't think it provides as much information in regards to some of what um, transpired there that day, transpired over there during that, that time period. And I know, I think I had requested from Chief Ting a copy of the agreement, and I will double check to see whether he's returned it or not. Yeah. Are there any other updates? Um, I think we can move to public. Well, I'll just give an update based on based off of Deborah's update. Um, as she said, we do have two vacancies on this committee. Um, one is reserved for a youth member of the community, um, which is a position that has not been filled in the entirety of this committee's existence. And then the other one is the position that was vacated when Freke became a town councilor. So there are two positions open at this time. So if anyone is interested in serving on the committee, they can fill out a um, community activity form available on the town's website to show interest in being a member of this committee. Um, and I guess I also wanna give a shout out to Hala Lord, who's in the audience. Uh, she is our town counselor liaison that was appointed back a few months ago. So thank you for joining us today. Um, and I think we can move to public comment. I'm gonna read the, pub uh, I'm not gonna read the public comment thing. Um, basically public comment, we won't respond to. Um, you have up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair and uh, raise your hand if you want to participate and I will call on you and we'll allow you to talk. And alrighty. Um, so yeah, if you could just state your name when you are allowed to talk. That's I don't like the word allowed to talk. It makes me feel anyway. <laughs> like power and control. I don't like it. All right. I'm gonna bring Tem in. Hey, hello everyone. Hello. Hey. Hello. Yes, uh, my name is Tim Blessed, also known as Mr. Cleese Ferreira. Um, I'm here in support of Deborah Ferreira. Um, you know, it's it's uh, sad and frustrating and infuriating as someone who is an Amherst resident, also the director of the ABC program, uh, to have someone like her who has given her time and service to this town to better it uh, time after time. Um, you know, not only is she a single mom, but a widower, not only is she amazing, but someone who truly cares about this town, um, to have, um, someone like Paul playing politics. That's clearly what's happening. It's clear that this is retaliatory because, um, there is no clear reason why he wouldn't just want to automatically reappoint, uh, Deborah. Um, and it's clear that he doesn't have a reason why he, he, you know, wouldn't re just automatically reappoint her. So um, I say shame to, to Paul. Um, he should be ashamed of, of himself. Uh, there was a time actually when politicians would serve the people and it seems like in, instead he's just being petty um, um, to have someone like Deborah and others who have a strong voice, who are looking out for people and representing oftentimes the voice of the voiceless. Um, people who are busy, who can't be at these meetings, um, having Deborah there um, is just uh, not, it's it's necessary and needed. And so um, 
you know, watching this unfold, I think of, um, you know, this, the story, The Hidden Figures, um, which was dra dramatized in, in the movie where you have such talent, you have uh, people who care, people who are here um, to give of themselves in voluntarily. This isn't a paid position, y'all. I, um, I often, you know, I know Deborah very well. Uh, she's my sister. Um, and I'm often like, uh, why are you doing this? You know, because she cares. She cares, y'all. She really cares. And to think that, um, you know, someone is having this talent, this intelligence, uh, a voice that you need in order to have uh, government work well and, and to represent all folks in Amherst and to just say, oh, I don't know if I want to reappoint you. It, it's, just, it's just petty and classless, honestly. And I, I wonder when Paul's time is up because maybe he should think about resigning um, because he's clearly out of touch. And so um, we're here, there's, there's countless other people that have Deborah's back and, um, you know, Paul should reconsider. And honestly, I don't know um, what he's thinking because, you know, he, he's clearly not thinking right on the situation. That's my public commentary. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Vera Duangmane. Can you all hear me? Hi, Vera. Hi, I am uh, sad to be providing this public comment because it's shocking to have to come to do a public statement in support of someone who, as Tem said, it should be a no-brainer. It should have been an automatic renewal of your term, Deborah. And to have to express and communicate how this is so bizarre, um, and that we, as a community, are who who love and and breathe and and work very hard and tireless tirelessly to fight for people who who don't have a voice. Um, it is a shame. Paul Balkaman, there should be a vote of no confidence on his leadership in for in this in this town. Lynn Greismer, as the town council president, ought to also be held accountable because they work in partnership. And I don't understand why. There is such a disconnect. It's not even necessary, right? He appointed you originally, so he knows who you are, you know, what you represent. And the fact that he wants to say, oh, you know, I'm going to institute a term limit, it doesn't even make sense, like you stated, Deborah. So, you know, I have no confidence in the town manager. Um, it's clear that he has just um, personal interest in being vested um, in this town government to collect his pension. Um, it's just sad to say that he has um, no heart, no heart, absolutely no heart in the way that he's conducting and behaving in relationship to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Okay. Oh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. In, in being infuriated is an understatement of how I'm feeling about trying to get Deborah off of this committee. I want to emphasize to Paul and everybody listening that without Deborah Ferreira, there is no crest, there is no Department of DEI, and there is no Community Safety Working Group recommendations. It is absolutely retaliation that she is trying to be banned from this committee. Um, her leadership has been incredible. She has been a voice to the voiceless. She has written to make sure that the CSWG's original recommendations have been the forefront of this committee's work. And it would be it would be awful to lose her and her leadership. Um, I hope that Paul reconsiders this. 
And I hope, Deborah, that you get to stay. And thank you for all the hours and the time that you've taken to advocate on behalf of these incredible initiatives. Um, and thank you for your voice. I, it matters to me, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Ms. Pat. Yes. Okay, so Pat Ananibako, I actually am not surprised about what is happening to you, Deborah. Unfortunately, I predicted this last year because Paul Bachman is predictable. He is revenge, re revengeful. This is pure retaliation for the excellent work that you're doing with CSSJC and the one you did at CSWG. I just want to remind everyone that when CSWG recommended this committee, we were very clear that two rep from CSWG will serve on CSS at CSSJC and there was no time limit that we recommended. Paul, with his control, made up his own rule and decided to appoint me, for example, for one term last year. And I knew this is going to happen to me if I wanted to be you know, reappointed. I figure that I can still be extremely very effective by not serving on CSS JC, and I've been doing that. Deborah, you know how I feel about you. I, you know, you have my hundred percent support, and I appreciate everything you've been doing for this community. Paul has no conscience. He does not care about DEI. He cares about his retirement. He cares about the white powerful people in this town, MS Forward Town Council, and the business community. But guess what? We will continue to fight because if we don't fight, it will be worse. DEI department is in chaos. It's very disorganized. And this is what Paul wants. Chris is in disarray and he is sabotaging the work that CSWG recommended. We knew this all along, so it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. I've been calling on Paul to resign because if people are paying attention in this town, there is a pattern for this guy. If you speak against the town government, he will retaliate. He did that with groups that are led by strong BIPOC women in this town, including my group, and refused to allocate APA funds to three groups led by women who have criticized the town government and corruption. Okay, so this is his pattern. Nobody should be surprised. That's who he is. White man behaving very badly. And he has his support. And that's why he's able to do that. But we should remind him that we pay him to work for us. It is tax dollars. He is answerable to, you know, taxpayers. And I also want to mention that um, whether or not he appoints you, reconsider. I don't think you should accept the temporary one. You're a very smart, intelligent, accomplished attorney. That's insulting. Will he do that to you know, a white person? Absolutely no. That is insulting. Do not take that. And I hope you know other members, if Deborah is not reappointed that you guys consider resigning to show solidarity with, 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 with Deborah. 
Allegra, thank you for your leadership. Um, Alvin, I can't say your name correctly. I appreciate you very much. Uh, you guys sacri sacrificed a lot to, you know, to move our town forward. And this man doesn't care. This is our town. And we have to continue to push for change. I will stop and hopefully I will have a chance to speak again later tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Hi, I Hello. am a victim. Hi, I am a victim of domestic violence. This is really a difficult call. So I want to say, I'm really glad that Deborah's on the phone. I'm really glad that Vera's on the phone, and I'm really glad that Miss Pat is on the phone. Um, this is really difficult to talk about. I am under a permanent order of protection, which is in place. My address and my confidentiality are protected by the Commonwealth because of the restraining order, which is permanent. But I am more than a victim. I'm a resident who has been denied services by a subgrantee of the town's federally funded community block grant. The Amherst Survival is the subgrantee. I want to say, just having listened to your comments, that I am completely shocked and devastated that Mr. Bockelman is even considering denial of Ms. Ferreira's request to continue in her current role on the CSSJC, because I would never have called. I have watched her for years from a distance, trying to figure out who I can trust, where the most safe places to speak, and how I can be okay coming forward. And I trust her, even though I've never met her completely. So I'm just gonna start to try to read this so that there is a record for later and so that you can come back to it. On the top of page 251 of the town manager's proposed fiscal year 25 budget, the CDBG grants are noted. The receipt of these funds requires adherence to federal laws and guidelines, yet I have been denied food, harassed, and discriminated against by Kate, I believe her legal name is Kate Ben Ezra, of the Amherst Survival Center. The town counselors were all made aware of the town human rights director's investigation into her misconduct and its report, which came out in March. I want to make sure that you are in receipt of this document because my guest is in the middle of a major cover-up of epic proportions that is taking place right now. You are not. I'm extremely glad that Councillor Lord is present on this call because she also from the town clerk received a copy of the report. After the human rights director, Pamela Nolan Young, who is responsible for conducting investigations like this, released her report in March, Kate Ben Ezra retaliated, retaliated against her complaining to the town manager about Pamela Nolan Young as investigator. I was mortified and shocked that she had the audacity to do this, but I understand now what is taking place. She then made public comments on April 22nd on the Human Rights Commission meeting asking that the body's bylaws be changed and requesting that the identities and residences of complainants be public. She did this six times. This is how victims get killed. She knew who the victim was because the board of directors had taken a complaint related to her misconduct prior to the investigation that took place 
in the human rights director's purview. It is the town manager's responsibility to monitor CDBG subgrantee activity and apply corrective actions regarding performance failures as the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities reserves the right to suspend payments under a contract with the municipality or determinate grant awards based on a finding of non-compliance, fraud, abuse, poor performance representation, or mismanagement by the subgrantee. I can tell you, I have not received food at the Survival Center since October 18th. The town manager has failed to bring the Amherst Survival Center back into compliance. I presented this during public comment to the town's finance committee in detail on June 4th, and I hope you will all listen to it. It's extremely important. Monitoring subgrantee performance by program administrators includes risk assessments. The town becomes complicit and open to litigation. They are complicit in misconduct when it does not effectively monitor subgrantees and bring them into compliance. Paul Balkerman was notified about this on November 6th of 2023, and Nate Malloy was notified on January 29th of this year of Kate Ben Ezra's misconduct. Since being made aware, Attorney Bascom, who was on the Community Development Block Grant Committee, resigned. On page nine of the May 6th Town Manager's Report, the CDBG grant application is noted. He notes, quote, the Town Council is now reviewing social service funding, end quote. I don't know what happened. What? Hello? Yeah, sorry. I think it looked like it was muted. It's hard to tell with the, just the phone. I, I, this, I don't know what happened. So the, the town council is now reviewing social service funding as we speak, which is why these matters need to be considered. The counselors are accountable to the public. And the town is authorized to take actions against subgrantees, including recapturing, terminating, and suspending funds. Can you still hear? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The Community Development Block Grant triggers federal requirements, and the Amherst Survival Center is in violation of those requirements in its current contract year agreement. 2022 to 2023 with the town. So I'm going to try to explain this because it's really important. In January of 2023, Kate Ben Ezra attempted to curtail the speech of a victim of domestic violence in violation of the victim's First Amendment rights. On February 10th of 2023, she attempted to seize the context of the victim's cell phone which is referred to as compelled encryption. She did not have a warrant. She is not an officer of the law. She harassed the victim repeatedly throughout the Amherst Area Gospel Choir performance, inquiring as to the contents of her phone and trying to obtain it. On August 18th of 2023, her staff failed to protect the victim in violation of an order of protection when a volunteer who was openly disparaging her religion and discriminating against the victim while taking pictures of her license plate and threatening to engage in technology affiliated abuse. This type of harassment is particularly, particularly dangerous to a victim of domestic violence and yet it was permitted on the property. And instead of calling assistance from the police on that day, 
when her volunteers' words rose to threat, she retaliated against the victim and restricted her ability to access food. On October 19th of 2023, the victim was trying to safely park in a parking spot. And in a, yet another mid-level violent provocation, banging on her window, traumatizing her in her vehicle, Kate Ben Ezra called the police and asked the Amherst Police Department to trespass a victim. No crime was committed. Nothing rose to the level of a need for a police response. The victim is not a criminal. And yet, Kate Ben Ezra weaponized the Amherst Police Department to frighten, intimidate, and harass her. This is retaliation because the victim is speaking truth to power and reporting wrongdoing and misconduct to the town. On November 27th, 2023, two weeks after the victim had met with the board of directors regarding the misconduct of Kate Ben Ezra, she removed the victim mid shop from the food pantry after she had been permitted to shop, denying her access to food in yet another instance of intimidation, harassment, and retaliation, also in violation of the state attorney general and Massachusetts laws regarding protecting victims. On December 23rd, the victim received an email from the board president of the Amherst Survival Center containing the personally identifiable information of yet a third separate complainant who had also reported egregious misconduct by Kate Ben Ezra. The board president, who was an employee of the town at the time, then instructed the victim to destroy the evidence. She is no longer employed by the town. Since then, multiple other individuals have come forward with complaints against Kate Ben Ezra. It is the responsibility of the town to ensure victims are protected with respect to their physical safety and otherwise from discrimination and harassment. Denying a victim of domestic violence at 114% of the federal poverty level access to the food pantry is in violation of federal regulations, CDBG contract regulations, municipal bylaws, it is also in violation of everything the CSSJC stands for. Press responders have acted with professionalism, as has the Director of Human Rights, who has been retaliated against for being an honest, ethical, moral, unbiased attorney in this town. I have no words other that this is the best place for me to be, and I am completely mortified that anyone would think in any world that taking Deborah off this committee is a good idea. Absolutely mortified, but I am not going to stop. The Attorney General has been notified, the federal government has been notified, the Housing and Urban Development Office has been notified, everyone at the Executive Office of Health and Living Community, everyone. I have letters out to everyone. And yes, I know what it feels like to be retaliated against. What is going on right now is absolutely unacceptable. And it is, a, it is a, a, an effort to silence me and to cover up egregious misconduct. And it needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And if if you'd like to send along the document that you referenced, my email is my last name dot first name at gmail. Um, last name dot first name at gmail. Yeah. Yeah. It, Allegra, there's multiple, multiple documents. It's uh, bad. Well, I... Don't look forward to receiving them, but if you would like to send them to me, I will certainly look them over. And I appreciate you coming to speak with us. Um, Share it with me too, okay? All right, and now we have Amber. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, Amber Connell Martin. I'm a resident of District 2, uh, former town council candidate. Um, just came on here to um, say that I support Deborah Ferreira. Um, Deborah, I hope that you, um, Paul Bockelman, will reappoint you um, to this committee. I think your leadership is really, really important. Um, I mean, it's been very clear to me since um, the CSWG began its work um, how crucial your role has been. Um, and particularly um, once it was time to put those recommendations into action, um, I feel, you know, fully that that um, we wouldn't be as far as we are if it wasn't for your hard work and your fellow committee members, but your leadership really stands out. And, um, you know, as a candidate, I was really struck by how my other fellow candidates incumbents for town council were saying, you know, we we got Cress, we made, we created Cress, and this is a victory, and we have a DEI office. And, and you know, the truth is, none of that would have happened without your advocacy. Um, and I, I think that at every turn, you know, there were um, barriers put in the way and obstacles, and you guys just, you know, continuously find a way around them. You also let the community know when our voices need to be heard, you know, when Cress was really struggling and didn't have leadership. Um, you guys sounded the alarm and the community came out. And, um, you know, I think your work is so essential. Um, I can't understand how it's even possible that um, Paul Bachman wouldn't reappoint you considering there's two vacancies on the committee right now. And you're a very strong leader. Um, and this committee cannot take a, a loss of a really strong leader right now. Um, and and really just makes absolutely no sense. And I also call on the town council. Um, if Paul Bachman is not doing the right thing, the town council is the supervisor um, of Paul Bachman. And so the town really needs to take action, especially candidates who said how much they supported Cress and how much they supported racial justice. Um, if you support those things, then you need to support um, the advocates that are actually getting this work done. Um, and so I would encourage the town council to to step in um, if needed to this situation um, and if Deborah is not uh, reappointed. Um, thanks for listening. I support you, Deborah. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Um, hi, my name is Nadine Mazard. Um, I am Nadine, we can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay. So hello, my name is Nadine Mazard. I am a resident of Amherst over 30 years. I am calling to uh, provide my support for Deborah Ferreira for her to continue to be on this committee. I have done my research um, together. I think also um, Councilman, Councilwoman um, Allegra Clark also had on there, which was about the fact that there are many committees where there are people who have longer terms. I think it is unfair and inappropriate that you are not given one more chance if you want to participate on there. Um, I do agree that this is our um, arbitrary and capricious. And so I do think change needs to be put in order. Um, I will also be forwarding my findings to Paul in your support. Thank you. And I also have Linda Zingbein, who's also here wants to say something. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm also speaking in support of uh, Deborah Ferrer's reappointment uh, to Cress. I think, especially at this moment in our local community, but nationally, it's important that we have strong, established leaders who have vision, but also have the experience to make sure that we advance the cause of racial justice in Amherst, um, and and we establish ourselves as real leaders in our broader area. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to to speak in support of Deborah's reappointment. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nadine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello, my name is Philip Avila. I am a uh, previous member of CSSJC as well as the old Human Rights Commissioner Chair. Um, I just want to speak to Deborah's leadership and her ability to connect with individuals. My time on CSSJC was amazing because of all the amazing people that I served with, uh, Deborah being one of them. And 
I would just like to say that it would be sad to see you not on this committee. I think you bring a wealth of knowledge and integrity to the committee. And I think that that goes a long way when we're talking about racial justice and racial healing in the town, especially coming from a strong black woman as yourself. So I hope that you continue on this committee and I give you my full support in doing. Thank you, Phil. Thank Good you, to Phil. hear from you. Yes. Greetings, my name is Evelyn Aquino and I'm calling in support of Deborah Bean and the CSSJC committee. There is, I'm not sure there's a more fearless leader in this community that has worked so hard all of these years to not just represent herself, but to represent the voices and the community and the, uh, the people, the young people, the people in the shadows pushed to the margins. We need her. She represents us. There's no reason, and I don't even want to repeat what everyone else has said about appointment. We have seen plenty, plenty of egreg egregious, egregious and retaliatory actions that are unbelievable in our committees and our town council. There's no reason Deborah should not continue to be on this committee and continue to lead this town toward justice toward equity that we speak of so consistently and have such a hard time demonstrating. I'm calling in full support of Deborah being reappointed because she has not even been close to the term that supposedly um, they're supposed to um, have a limit. The first one that she worked with, I can't always remember all the letters, was a working group. We will not be dumbified by the little details that often keep us shut we say, oh, no, we cannot because, no, we're not doing that. We're going to get the details, and we're going to continue to fight for justice in this town. The, the, the dumbifying and the ignorance that continues to put people in positions and keep people in positions that do not represent the people, those days are over. We're here to work. And Deborah's a fearless leader that has held us to the fire, that has put us on check, that has made us responsible, that you know, when it's time to get up and do what we got to do, Deborah's on the call. Deborah's, how are we going to sit back when Deborah works so hard as a single mother to show up? Then we we have to be on notice. So Deborah, thank you for your leadership, and it would be an absolute heartbreak and an absolute disgust of uh, being a member of this community if Deborah's not reappointed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening. I'll tell you, this is a um, very profound meeting to have this conversation going, to have the new crest, well, new new for me in terms of meetings, but the new crest director here, and, and to understand the continuity of this whole effort toward a, a new community safety vision. Deborah Ferrer has been central to that. But I have to say, she doesn't need to continue on another day, another month. She has paid her dues. She has put the work in she, for all the things that Sister Evelyn just said and others have said. She's really done her part. But if she wants to continue to bring the continuity of leadership, then by all means, that should be upheld. That should be maintained. But really, the work is there. The vision is there. What is, to, what is missing is the accountability, is that the conversation with this town manager, with the town itself, has to get real. And Deborah Ferrer has been that person stressing, keeping it 100% real to the issues. And, she, and, and it's to the issues and to the vision, I have to say that. Because to the issues, she could have ignored with, when the first Crest director was coming on board and said, hush, 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 about July 5th. But that's not Deborah Ferrer. She spoke it out, she brought it out that that was wrong and needed accountability. And a lot of time went into getting that that really should was just wasted because of the lack of leadership from the town manager who sits above 
who sits above the police chief. So even if the police chief is on vacation, even if the police chief isn't doing, doing what's right, the town manager has to be held to account. And so this continuity is what we need on both the issues and the broader vision, making it happen the way it's supposed to happen. Please, let us take this opportunity to affirm all that she has done. And if she is willing to continue a day further, a month further, a year further, whatever, then by all means, let's maintain the continuity of leadership here with Deborah Ferrer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing any other hands up at this time. So I believe we can move on to our action items, starting with the press update. Okay. Hi, um, Commander Theriak. I'm actually going to start with the DEI update because I have that in front of me. Um, the assistant director search has garnered over 22 resumes. The committee has made recommendations to the town manager. The town manager is scheduling interviews with the finalists. The pool is approximately 60% female, 40% male, and over 75% of the pool has self-identified as being from a marginalized group. Um, in responses to the technical assistance RFP for the resident oversight board are under review. Um, youth empowerment is not under the purview of DEI. However, the department will offer limited programming in the fall. And the DEI department will host a Pride event on Thursday, 3 p.m., reading of the proclamation for Pride Month and flag raising by the members of town council at town hall, 3.30 p.m., walk to alumni house one block away, 4 p.m., rock remarks by Justice Roderick Ireland, followed by the panel discussion. The moderator is Josh Benson, a Crest responder. The panelists are former town select board member, Connie Kruger, Marguerite Sheehan, and current town councilor, Pat DeAngelis. All of the panelists were married in Amherst, Mass. 5 p.m., a reception following the panel discussion. Juneteenth on the town common will happen on Saturday, June 15th, 2024. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Please join us on the town common for some music and relaxation, a community gathering to help spread kindness and good cheer. Come and meet representatives from several community partners who work hard daily to make Amherst vibrant and strong. So that is the DEI update. Now we'll go on to the Cress update. Um, I wanted to let you know that I'm very happy to be here and that we are making so much progress with CRESS. Right now, I can tell you that for the month of April, there were 73 calls, and that for the month of May, there were 135, which is a vast increase. The majority of the calls came through directly to our line or through meeting up in the public. Uh, right now, we are working with the GPL to finalize the SOPs for the dispatch center, um, the emergency center. And those should be completed by next week and should be ready for implementation within the next two weeks. Um, that was one of my first goals when I was appointed. And I am excited because I've had great work with Mike Curtin, who is retiring, and his successor, Jason. Um, also, as far as the youth empowerment that I saw, youth empowerment, again, is not under the purview of CRESS either. However, one of the things that we are working on is getting some summer programming for um, the youth and I'm working to form partnerships with the Amherst Mobile Market, the Amherst School, and um, the, like I had a list here. Um, Butternut and Olympia Oaks to work together with them um, and families 
and get something together for the kids this summer and families. That's my report. So, um, oh, yeah, go thank ahead. you. Yeah. Um, Camille, you glanced over, um, you, you mentioned the resident oversight board, but I didn't fully get what you said about the RFP. Um, so can you go back to that for a second? Okay, that's from DEI, and it's just a one sentence that says responses to the technical assistance RFP for the uh, resident oversight board are under review. Okay, and in reference to the number of calls that were increased for CRESS, I yes. think one, you said some came directly into the CRESS line and then others are from, can you elaborate on what that means? Pardon, you froze for a moment. On the street meetup part, um, you said some came directly into the crest line, and yes. then others are, I believe you said others are from street meetup. Um, oh, so I'm not sure when I heard, we're out yeah. in the community, so a lot of times what happens is during community engagement, where our crest responders are out in the community, meeting folks where they're at, um, we will get stores and businesses that will talk to us about people that are in the neighborhood. We also get referrals. So for example, we had a referral today from Soldier On about a veteran who was in need and sent the responders out and it was wonderful because the veterans spoke of how um, they have a brain injury and how in the past, in different cities, they've been arrested because they have a disability that limits their speech and their mobility. So um, when they were sent, the cops were sent to them at that time, they were detained, et cetera. And in this case, because it was a crest responder, they were so happy to see us. And they were able to get some information and start services. And one of the things that had happened was this uh, veteran did not have food. They allowed the Crest responders to look in the fridge to see what they needed. And then um, the Crest went to the Amherst Survival Center and obtained food for this veteran. So the next step is they were contacted by the senior center downstairs and veteran services. And as a bridge, we are working together to get this veteran the services he needs. And once again, I'm very pleased that the police were not needed for this. From the from the increased volume of calls that Cress has seen, are there any that um, were redirected from the police to say, okay, here's some calls that let's have Cress respond as opposed to the police? Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me because actually we're working on pulling See, the problem is, is that we cannot get access uh, currently to all the calls. So that is one of the things that is happening with the SOP is that with this, we are getting a better idea of what's going on. And also because of the way um, the dispatches run there, you have to have another certification to be able to look at all the logs. So those are some of the things that we're working on. I'm sorry, when you say other certification to look at other logs, what do you mean? Um, you have to be, there's a certain quarry certification that you have to go through. And you're saying the Crest team doesn't have that core certification? No, very few people do. Only um, the supervisors in the police department. So we're working on that so that I may get access. And is it this is it this something that every crest responder would need to respond to calls redirected by the no, police? No. What this is, we're all Corey certified. Okay. Okay. What this is, is this is so it will enable me to go in and pull reports and find out. And one of the things that had been talked about with um the dispatch supervisor is that we would start getting together and I love little people. We would start getting together, pulling the logs and checking through monthly to see what calls that could have been directed to Crest that weren't. And the other thing that's happening now is we're working on trainings um, with our responders and the dispatchers to 
figure out, you know, exactly how to triage or do the call tree to figure out what calls definitely can go to Crest. It's it's a process. Um, and so, one of the, no. so I know that you're new to your role and, and it's perfectly fine if you can't answer this question, but have you met with... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you met with, Rose, Rose yeah. <laughs> have you have you met with Chief Ting to discuss um calls that Chris may able to take in lieu of the police? Yes, we have. Actually through the government performance lab with the GPL. He is very active in our working together with APD and the dispatch center. So the four of us in that Cress the APD, the dispatch center, and the GPL have all met via Zoom. And also the GPL came out here at the beginning of May to work on our SOPs to get these finalized. Um, when I came on, my first order of business that I wanted done was to make sure that the SOPs were completed so that um, in, in, so that because one of the big things is, is that there was nothing in writing that had for the dispatch, the um, the standard operating procedures were not there. There was a list, but this way it is very clear cut. It is um, actionable and it is ready for the dispatchers to go down the list and say, okay, this is a crest call, send crest. This is not a crest call. If it involves violence, if they know that a certain person in the past has had violence tendency, this is not a crest call. It, if, it's a, if it is a well-being check, this is a crest call. If it is someone that is in a doorway um, in the morning, an unhoused person, this is a crest call. So those are the things we are working on. Thank you. And Last question, because I see um, Deborah has her hands up. Um, so I, I think this may be your second month. Um, do you find that you have the resources that you need from the town to um, continue the mission of Cress as it was originally intended? Do you, th do you find that things are moving the way that you're comfortable that um, Cress is becoming um, a strong part of Amherst? I honestly do in a lot of ways. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we're looking at resumes now for um, an administrative assistant because that has been a major issue right now is that we do not have an administrative assistant. So that has slowed down a lot of things. But I really believe that with the talent that is here at Crest, my responders are amazing. And now that I'm here, things are starting to fall into place. We're starting to um, work on programming. We're working on how to deal with different situations. We are working on finding better resources for people that are unhoused, finding better resources for the people who are having a mental health issue. So those are just some of the things, um, working on de-escalation uh, when we go out in the community, when people call us, having disputes with neighbors. So those are the type of things that we're working on that are, people are calling us more directly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really great questions, Everald. Um, Camille, I have a few kind of questions and comments, and I guess, you know, want to get like more clarification around things. Um, so it was kind of like abbreviated. So I guess maybe you can't answer this, but I think you also kind of referred to it. So it was, you mentioned it twice, I guess, in DEIA report and the DEI report, and then in your section about youth empowerment. I thought youth empowerment was within the DEI, DEI um, department because beforehand, Jennifer and I think someone from another group that they that that Pamela had hired were doing surveys and they were doing other things to try to do some workshops with with youth. So I'm a bit confused right now when you say that DI is saying that youth empowerment is not within the purview. I know that the center 
um, and establishing the center is something that Paul said he was going to establish some type of group or what have you to, to look into that and to, to establish the actual center. But programming, I thought, was within DEI. Can you clarify that or is that something I need to ask Pamela? So what I can say is um, I had a discussion. Uh, you, wow. So many late nights this week. Um, I had a discussion with Ray over at Parks and Rec uh, Recreation, and they received the $500,000 grant to do feasibility studies and everything else for youth empowerment. And that is what they are doing. What Press is working on, as far as programming, et cetera, is we are working on a summer program that would encourage youth. Because as you know, that when youth are off on the summer, uh, during the summer month, they lose a lot of the um, gains that they have made during the year. So one of the things that we have looked at, um, along with encouragement and being there for de-escalation and just being there as um, a powerful force is to go to some of these housing areas of uh, BIPOC community to be able to be there to support the youth and their families and also to work with our resources that we have our partners so that we can make a change. So this is why I said I'm trying to, um, I spoke with the Amherst Mobile Market um, and I'm going to be having meetings with them soon so that we can team up with them to bring information about Crest, bring information about our resources and be a face so that people, when they see us in our gray, they know that we're the people that they can come to, that they don't need to worry about a police officer showing up, that if they have a need, will be there. So these are things that are coming. Um, it's going to take some time. We've started looking at um, supplies that we need. We have started looking at some programming and one of the responders has really done some research into what's needed in this community because they came from this community. Um. The other, the other thing is around, you know, just in terms of, I know there's a lot of community members listening. So when you say SOP, I don't think people really know what you mean by that. Can you clarify what SOP means? Sorry, that's from the firefighter in me. SOP mm -hmm. is standard operating procedure. So what happens is, and I just found out this today because I spoke to, uh, we had a Zoom meeting with, get his name right, Amos Irwin from the uh, LEAP report. And one of the things that he spoke of is that Amherst was one of the first to be, let me make sure here, they're certified. So all of their standard operating procedures and their directives and everything else are certified every three years. So we are working with their um, standard operating procedures and their directives to build out uh, conformity between police, fire, and CRESS so that when we respond to calls or when they call us and give us information, we all have the same language. There is, it's very much a different language than you would use on the street when you hear calls on the radio. So they are very clear, they're concise, they give the information, there's no extraneous chatter. It just is built upon what needs to be done. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I agree with that. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and, and I think obviously, you know, you're still kind of only been in, you know, for about two months or whatever the, the, the case may be. So, you know, we, we do want as a CSS, you see just some information that's kind of like, you know, more of a report basis. If we could get that from you, obviously with some data, um, you know, and, and kind of really delineating some of the key um, highlights that CRAS has done, let's say for, for the past month, um, including like something that, you know, I know I'm interested in and we've been talking about it is around, you know, I'm, I'm happy that there's various avenues that people can contact CRAS, right? So direct line or through outreach, right? And you all are able to make those connections. But one of the main things that we've been, you know, 
really fighting for is that also it be dispatched because there's still a lot of people that contact um, the police department, but yet they don't necessarily want the police to go out. And I think me and you had uh, that conversation um, when we had our one-on-one, -on -one, which is a lot of times if the police are sent out and then Crest is sent out, maybe already there might have been already some damage occurred. Let's say if the police aren't able to handle the situation the way that the person wanted it handled, which is a lot of times de-escalation and things like that, because the police, they have their lane and Crest has their lane, right? And so, so I, you know, our thing is how can th these things be delineated so that Crest can be initially sent out as opposed to the police sent out and then let's say Crest sent out, right? So we need to figure those out. And so in terms of dispatch, I know that there were certain kind of calls that, that Crest was being called in. Um, do you have what those calls are as of today and then you know, what other calls are going to be added to that so that then Crest will be called? Because again, from CSWG and, and the recommendations that CSWG made, it should be all nonviolent um, calls should be going to Crest, whereas the police, right, deal with anything that has, you know, threat, immediacy of, of violence, um, any type of, you know, situation where, they, you know, there potentially could be violence, anything like that, the police would be called in. So do you know where, where things stand with that? I was actually just looking for the list. Um, mm -hmm. Just right now on my desk, I have everything else. So one of the things when you mentioned about um, people still calling the police, I think due to the fact that I've been very vocal and very visible, I've been to many events, I've met up with districts um, and been very open to speak with people. What I've heard from the people that have called, because like you said, people are afraid to call the police because they don't want the police for these things. So I believe that the uptick in our calls and the amount of places that we've gone to is because police, because people do not want to call the police. So instead, because we're very vocal, we have our number. I was on WHMP. Um, the end of last month and gave our number. Um, Amherst Media, I did an interview with, gave our number. So I think that people are starting to hear about us. So they're actually calling us directly. So I believe that that is a major portion of why that the police are not getting these type of calls. Now, the ones that are still going there, again, that's the beauty of a standard operating procedure is that by going through the list and going through and saying, all right, is this a police call or is this a crest call? And that's training with the dispatchers and knowledge. And we have new dispatchers and um, now we have like a new police. I mean, yeah, a police chief that is new as a chief, you know, I'm new. So the beauty of it is that we're all learning at the same time and it is for these new dispatchers, this isn't a new normal, this is just normal. So for the older dispatchers that have been there, there's been retirements, et cetera, this is also becoming their new normal. So I have faith that everything is changing for the better and people are really starting to realize that they don't need the police, that they can just call Cress. Some of the other, you know, just from, and, and I, again, you know, a lot of what I do is obviously post questions that community has, has brought to me. And, I, you know, as I say, I, I try to be a voice for the community because a lot of folks can't be here at this time because, right, they're working second shift, they're taking care of their families, they don't have the time to be um, on, on our meetings. And so I try to pose some of those questions. Um, so, um, you know, some of, of, the comments that I've gotten or questions is that um, with with some of the new responders that are being hired to make sure that there's still a lot more kind of um, different um, diverse backgrounds, different languages and things like that. They want the responders also to be ref reflective, right? Of the communities that we're servicing, especially the BIPOC communities, communities that are of marginalized voices. So we want to make sure that as we continue to hire, so, you know, I know you you, you shared some stats for the assistant director 
um, you know, the administrative assistant, and then also for the responders, you want to make sure that it's a plethora of, you know, different backgrounds so that it, it, it has that type of diversity, right? Age diversity, so that there's, 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 Folks that that can that can be receptive to all different ages, backgrounds, English as a second language, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to kind of share that feedback because those, that's some of the feedback that that I've been um, receiving from the community. So hopefully that could be something that you know will be integrated as some of these uh, new hires move forward. I am excited that you all are hiring an, an assistant director because that's pivotal and critical. Oh, wait, um, given, that was a, that was administrative assistant that we're oh was it oh I thought it was assistant director yes Ooh. it's an administrative assistant right now okay so that's great administrative assistant but then start. the next the next thing should be an assistant director because we need that we 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 cannot have what what transpired before uh, which was one when the director um you know was removed basically put on an administrative leave um then there was no clear number two and and that was a mess you know. So hopefully, is there any plans for an assistant director hire? Um, at this point, I do not know. Uh, right now, I I don't know. Um, so there, but there's no funding for that. So that is that a Paul question? There, there is. So our funding if um is through through the town. Our funding is only supports um the eight responders and myself. The uh. Administrative assistant is coming through a DPH grant, and that is only through the end of the year. And also the um, implementation manager is also a grant funded position. Um, back to what you were saying about languages, I just wanted to let everyone know that we received pocket talks, which also came from the grant, and those have 82 languages on them and they are uh, GSM. And I actually, this Saturday at the Race Amity Day, was able to try out some of it with Brazilian Portuguese, um, and it worked very well. So we may not have people that directly speak the language, but this is enabling us to reach a much broader population than we already have. Well, that's great. Um, and, and obviously that's wonderful that you all are using things that can obviously communicate in different languages. You know, in, in terms of, like I was saying, in terms of CSWG and when we were making some of those recommendations is really to also hire people with like lived experiences that kind of come from those, you know, different backgrounds and things like that. We just want to make sure that there is a variety of diverse backgrounds within the responder because they're the ones that are going to be out there in the community. So we want, you know, people to see themselves also in um in, in the responders, right? Um, and that, that's that I can see that a lot of, right now. Yeah, a lot of the, the a lot of the town does not have a lot of diversity. Does not have a lot of, um, you know, um, you know, diverse employees and at at different levels and, and management levels. So that's why we want to make sure that you know we're we're monitoring and and focusing on on some of that too. Okay, we have um the responders that I have are diverse. They come from diverse backgrounds, socioeconomic levels, different levels of education, lots of lived experience. And even more so, they have some wonderful gifts that they have offered to the community in this town. I feel that what has happened over the past two months in a very short time has happened because I have wonderful people that work with for me. Um, and I, I couldn't be more pleased. I come to work enthusiastic and I hope my, well, I've been told my energy shows that I am so happy to be here and the work is getting done. It's taking time. And I know Deborah, you and I have spoken before about that. This has been a longer process for you than me. Um, but in the short amount of time that I've been here, I have put into place um programs etc and things that things are moving so what you see come even fall is going to be much better than what you see now can I, I just, can I just wait I just have two more questions and then you can, can, can Evel go because he yeah, has to I jump to off drop. oh you have to yeah. leave oh, okay yes. sorry and then we'll go back I, go I, I just I just want to add this um so the farmers market is back and 
Um, I'm hoping that Crest has a chance to put up some um, informational boost there on Saturdays so the community can be aware of Crest. Um, my office is across from Town Common and I see a lot of traffic there on Saturday mornings, so that's a good place to go. Um, but going back to part of what Deborah was saying, um, I am very concerned that there is no plan for an assistant director. Um, we were, Crest was in disarray because that was not in place. And I know that you're new and not saying that you're going anywhere, but an assistant director is not, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it's, it needs to be there. And this needs to be a priority for Crest because there has to be continuity. Um, anything can happen. You may not be, you may not try to leave, but you can be out for a while. There has to be someone available that can step in your role um, until you are back or if you are away somewhere doing something. And so um, that is very concerning that there isn't a budget or a plan for that person. And um, that really needs to be addressed. And, and that's my final point on that. Thank I you. I don't disagree. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Oh, Everald, also, I wanted to let you know, as far as the farmer's market, a team does go there every Saturday. We don't have a booth set up, per se, but we have gone to meet with all of the vendors, speak to people. Um, we have our business cards. And if you know or have seen on the back of the business card, there is a resource guide that people can get in touch with. Um, we also have our pamphlets we hand out. So we are becoming much more active in the community, doing um, engagement walks of downtown, going to Puffer's Pond, meeting with people. So it's about community and um, solution focus, getting things done. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so for me, I have uh, just a few more questions in terms of, I think we had spoken about that too, the hours, um, is the, are the hours still like 8.30 to 8 to 4, eight, eight, to, to, four. Four. eight yeah. to 4, Monday through Friday and 10 to 6 on Saturday. So, yeah. so are, are we, um, are we changing those hours anytime soon? Because again, um, I, 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 you know, that, so that's concerning we, to me. It is, but you have to remember we are a department of eight. And unlike um, the fire department talked about how in order to staff for 24 seven, it's 8,000 hours and eight people cannot cover 8,000 8, hours. So some of the things that I'm working on with also with dispatch is finding out what are the times that Crest is most needed. And as we progress through the summer and get this data, um, it's data driven is to figure out what are the times that Crest needs to be in the house. Okay. And also, as you know, the bank center is closed at four o'clock. So we're also trying to find other ways and outlets so that we can be out in the community at different hours and be safe. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's the thing, right? It's just like, well, maybe banks might not be the, the optimal place for Crest then, because, you know, like you said, it's just like right now you all, it seems as if you don't have the adequate funding, right. To be able to hire more responders so that you all can work longer, which has been something that CSSGC has been trying to get for, for, for Crest for the longest time is additional funding. Like, well, what Evelyn and I just talked about around the assistant um, director, but also it's not about having them be there from like eight to four, because that's not, you know, the, the time period that there's going to be the most calls and, and things like that, right? So maybe you all need to be there from, I don't know, you know, one to 10 or something like that or, or whatever, given the amount of hours that you all have. What I'm saying is that you all are really hampered by the fact that you're at the bank center that closes at four. And so it, it's not optimal for the consumers, the people that you all are trying to service, which is the community. So, so you know, those hours, and this is something, you know, I know you're new. And like I said, you know, I myself, Allegra, others, we've been dealing with this for quite a long time, right? These are, this is not new concerns that we're bringing up. These are old, age-old concerns that has been brought up since CSWG in terms of making sure that even if you're not doing 24-7, analyzing the hours where press uh, uh, is most effective and most needed in order to do it. Because, you know, when you bring bring up things like, like you know, 
of course, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about y'all working with young people and things like that. But I'm also sometimes concerned, right, that you all are not taking on tasks that you shouldn't be taking. Because, you know, when I hear some a program, I'm like, okay, great. But does that mean that you all, what do you, are you, are you now the tutors that are supposed to kind of make sure that people, that the students aren't losing their, their educational gains during the summer? I mean, that's not what, what Crest was created to be, right? Crest was created but to you, be. Excuse me, can I? Let me, yeah. let me just finish. An alternative to poli policing. It, it's not supposed to be teachers. There's, and that's why when you all were also, you know, lunch monitors and stuff like that, I'm concerned. You know what I'm saying? I'm excited but a little bit. But I'm concerned because I'm just like, is that your lane? Um, I, 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 I'm not sure about that. You know what I'm saying? So go ahead. The, the question I have for you then is the, the thing that you brought up before about youth empowerment. Okay. So if that I consider being in the schools, youth empowerment, being there to be able to um, direct youth, to be able to mitigate situations uh, where they don't need to call the police if there is something going on in the school. The same thing about being out in the community. Um, I look at that as youth empowerment or not even as just people empowerment because we're there when people are having difficulty but don't need the police to solve their problems. So it's a, it's a little bit of yes and. And when you spoke of the hours, okay, I totally understand that. And those are some of the things we're working on is figuring out what are the hours that we are most needed. Right now, like I said, last month, 135 calls, and that's between eight and four because people know to call us. And as the word is getting out, they don't need to call APD. They can call us directly. So everything that is happening has happened for a reason. It's the reason I think about it. And also some of the things that have happened is, is that to me, a lot of things were put in place before everything was actually ready. When Crest was started, SOPs or standard operating procedures should have already been in place to make an easy transition. Um, the hours and everything else, there, the feasibility study that was done, did it have hours in it is the question. I looked at some of the stuff and I looked at the LEAP report, okay, and trying to figure out what were the times that were identified here in Amherst that were most needed. So when I came in, you know, right now, these are the hours that were set were eight to four. Are they set in stone? No. Are they going to cha change? Most definitely. But I really want to get a good handle on what's going on in this community before I change things. Because I don't believe in just coming in and wiping the slate. You know, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of really good things that are already happening here and that just need to be built upon. And working with community members, with the CSSJC, with the, I'm making sure here, like, learning about the Black Business Association, working with 80 Acres. There's a lot of resources out there that are untapped that I'm working on figuring out where is our role in this community. Yes, we are an alternative to police. So we're starting with that. And that is our huge umbrella is the alternative police. But the other things, the little nuances that we provide, we are a bridge. We know and have gotten to know so many members of the community that we can sit there and tell someone, okay, you are a veteran and you just moved into a place and you don't have food. Okay, here is the Amherst Survival Center. You're a senior. Here's the Senior Center. There's also Meals on Wheels. So these are all the things that the responders already know in some ways. I'm learning. We also just had some responders trained in doing voucher um, for the Salvation Army. So there's a lot of trainings out there that we are getting while we are still, while well, I'm new and more contained. And as we get all this information and everything else, we can grow. And I can see this being much more.
and and yeah and allegra i'll, I'll let you uh, talk to, to to the hours and everything i mean uh, i hear you camille uh and obviously like i said that you know you, you're still here for you're new to 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 the position and you're, you're learning and kind of going through things and obviously you feel a, a bit of our frustration because we've been at this for years right mm -hmm. we haven't been at this for months we've been at this for years and so that's why we want to push things along so for me though th there was this p piece where there was that interim um um team that i think really started shifting a lot of the mission of what of, of what um, CRESS is supposed to be in terms of what um, CSWG recommended CRESS to be. And because of the hours, because of the place, because of, of, of this is all that CRESS could do because they couldn't do other calls and things like that, CRESS almost had to kind of uh, reformulate itself to fit into those pieces. So what I'm trying to tell you and hopefully move Cress along is to go beyond that, right? Because Cress was supposed to be a lot bigger than, than that. So that, that's why it concerns me. I mean, I think me and you have possibly a different interpretation of youth empowerment um, because, you know, you know, I, I just don't want you all to be limited within these parameters because you're at a place and because you have certain hours and then therefore you're only responding to certain things. You know what I'm saying? That's why my umbrella, which is very big, right? Which is really the focus of the mission of CSWG is alternative to policing. And we can't forget that because if we forget that, then Cress can, can get um, taken down a lot of different paths, right? Because yeah, you all are wonderful people. You all have a lot of a, a variety of trainings and you all are good people, good people at heart wonderful but i want you all to stay focused in terms of what press should be <laughs> needs to be and you know and and was created to be okay and, and, and that's so i want to make sure are. i want to make sure that that we're on on the same page and obviously you know we'll 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 continue to to share and continue to talk and continue to go through this process um because there's been a lot of um instability right with having a, a, a director, then having this interim team, now having a new director, right? So I am concerned. I am concerned about a loss of vision for Cress. And so my thing is, I want to make sure that I, myself and others on CSSEC continues to, 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 to guide Cress down the path of its vision and staying true to the vision. And with that, I have a, a last question, which is, I, I heard somewhere in the community that there was some type of proposal, and I don't know if you know about this or not, about um, a Cress being a co-responder, um, a co-responder type of model coming about, as opposed to it just being Cress autonomous um, department and you know being responsible. I, that's nothing I've heard of. Okay. No. Because um, I've, no, I've, I haven't yeah. heard nothing of that. Um, I I heard yeah. from a very reliable source that there was some proposal out there uh, for Crest being a co-responder. So I just want to say on on record, right in 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 recording, that hopefully that that that's not occurring. That there's no uh, back backdoor proposal out there for Crest to be a co-responder because that is not any in any type of vision of Crest. To be and, a correspondent with and ACT that, that or is with any beauty. other department. That is the beauty of when I came here. That is the beauty of Cress is that we are standalone, and we have a great working relationship with um, APD and AFD um, and the community. And I want to keep it that way. I feel that, as you said. We're in our lane, you know, yes, we cross paths a little bit on both sides with police and fire, but mm -hmm. we have a definitive role in the community. And my plan is to continue that role and make it stronger. Sorry, I took up a lot of airspace, Allegra. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so Camille, I did, I wasn't sure if you'd seen this part of the LEAP report, but there is a pretty good breakdown of both days where they identified Cress appropriate call time. Now, this okay, because I'm I've got my 
uh, it's on my desk continually is my four inch binders, mm -hmm. my, um, my onboarding binders. And one of the things I'm looking at here is this was over a year's time, correct? The or a meaning, couple of years. The meaning they're looking at data? Yes, how, how I was trying to look at the time frame. Now I've gone somewhere. <laughs> Where did it go? I've skipped pages. Um, you know what? I don't know how much, like what time frame. Because I was that? a year, I think at least a year. Least a year. More. I was going to say yeah. it, it looked like at least a year, maybe more than a year. And only because um, I'm trying to remember the call volume for the police department, which was in the budget hearing. And I actually, some of the questions were asked about what other calls that were under there that we could have gone to. And I was like the well-being checks for sure. Um, and the actual amount, I see you just had the well-being checks. Um, I mean, it to me, again, this is what I'm seeing in two months is that I'm seeing a, a shift in the number of calls that are being um, coming to us versus what would have gone to APD. Right. And, and I do think, because looking at the town manager's budget from the, you know, for the coming year, it did look like from last year, the way he reported things, there was like 3,000 less calls that went to the police this year or that went through 911. So I don't know. I mean... I'm not saying there were 3,000 calls into Crest, but I'm wondering like how much of that could capture some of the redirection of, you know, because I do, I, th I think that it's important, you know, to kind of piggyback off what Deborah said, like, obviously we want dispatch to be sending calls that are appropriate for Crest to Crest, but we also want people to call directly to Crest. Yes. Because I think there are, we've heard of some calls where maybe, I would feel comfortable saying like, okay, this person is a person known to police and gets violent towards police, but how much of that is because somebody's coming with a badge and a gun and and in this kind of, you know, this role that they have been cast in or that they have fulfilled in this person's history versus going in with a cooler, calmer approach. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, and I'll just say from my personal experience working with families who are kind of struggling with their loved one's mental health or substance use, when I talk about different options with them and when the police come up, most of the time they're like, no, we don't want to send the police. They'll just escalate things. Right. And and so there's a part of me that's like, okay, well, this person might have a history of violence with police or might escalate in a way that seems unsafe with police. But what happens if a trained social worker does sit down with them. Are they going to feel a different way because they're being approached in a different way or their perception of the approach is different? Um, but that wasn't so, me. So, so those are some of the things that we have talked about with um, dispatch. And I've actually had conversations with um, a few of the police officers for exactly that reason about how um, because I can talk to you from my own personal experience, having um, been a responder in Holyoke and going to a call and speaking with someone who was having a mental health issue and the police came up and they became agitated. And I was like, the, the police officers were like, we'll take it from here. And I'm like, they're fine. They're with me. And come to find out later that their intention was to arrest this individual. And my comment was, I mean, this is, uh, you know, two days later, was for what? So they weren't doing anything. So I do understand what you're talking about, how people become um, aggravated and can become elevated by situations when a badge and a gun is present. So, and, but those are the type of things that are, learned. And those are the type of things that having a relationship with APD and them saying, okay, we know this person is, has been known to. However, now that we've gotten to know you and your responders, okay, 
we realize that, you know what, it may be, it very well could be because of us and not them. So it's learning um, a person's behavior. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the police will know that this person becomes very aggravated when they show up. And because they know that they get aggravated when they show up, okay, that they've been called for, that they will say, you know what? No, this isn't. And that's the whole idea behind it is that, all right, as we're going through and through, people are going to learn more and more. Okay, you know what? This is not a police call. This is a crest call. And if something happens again with that individual, which is generally what happens, these are repeat callers, that they're the second time, they're not going to call the police. You know, they're going to call crest or they're going to call 911 or the non-emergency line and say send crest mm -hmm. so it's it's all it's a learning curve it is a very steep learning curve but is a learning curve so i had a question about the dei assistant director search and i don't know if you have the answer to this but so some of the more high profile searches we've had recently like the your position and the um police chief there have been community members involved in the search, and I wasn't sure if that was the case for the DEI assistant director or not. I That I have no information on. I don't know. But I can find out and let you know. Perfect. Um, can I just ask a quick follow-up? So that's the those are the statistics that you were talking about, assistant directors. So, so there's a search for assistant directors for DEI? Yes. I think yes. I confused yes. it with Crest. Oh. oh, okay. Okay. And you said right now uh, the town manager is is interviewing? Is scheduling interviews with the finalists. Is scheduling inter interviews for, with the finalists for the assistant director to the DEI? Yes. Okay. Um, so do you know, and, well, you probably don't, like when they're looking to hire? To make no, I do decision? not know. Okay. And I guess my other question would be around um, the schools piece. So I know, and I think, I think I appreciate the yes and kind of approach you have. And, and I also, my concern lies not necessarily in Cress becoming known to the youth in case there is something that comes up. But I think my concern is that Crest will be seen as like a stopgap because our schools are budgeted mm -hmm. um, yes. to not mm -hmm. have the programs that we need to support our youth, especially around the restorative justice. Um, and I'm I'm glad that there is a person on Crest staff that is very well trained in restorative justice. And I think that that's important, especially to bring into community if you're doing like mediation with neighbor disputes and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, but I guess, you know, I... I would be concerned more about Crest being positioned to be the gap filler permanently versus having a a relationship where you get called in when needed, but there's the actual infrastructure in the schools to provide that service on an ongoing basis. And that is true. So one of the things that has been happening with the uptick of our calls is that uh, the schools know that if we have calls that we are unable to go to the schools. So this has happened numerous times over the past month. Um, in fact, it happened a lot in May um, because there were so many calls that happened during that 11 to one hour. So it's, it's just how it is. And we've made it very clear to uh, the schools that while we would like to help, this is we are not uh, a permanent fixture. Again, that as we expand hours, there will be less people on each shift. So the ability to be able to do all of these extra um, curriculars, per se, in the schools will not, we just won't be able to do it. And I guess, you know, I don't know how much of your demographic and the people that you've been responding to or getting calls from have been like of a college population who's not here over the summer versus the year round population where there are maybe more youth members 
as well as more elderly members. But um, I guess kind of to piggyback again off what Deborah said, it would be nice to have. So we ha maybe I'll try and find the one that was sent to us, I think in April, but there was kind of a really nice breakdown of the data and I don't know where is it came from or how it was. Okay, is that the data? So one of the things that we're working on again is um, we also are working with the GPL to do a responder report that would have more information in it. You know, data drives everything. Mm -hmm. So um, working to get specific data that we need on like the demographics, et cetera. Um, and I think the data that was sent to you was um, the call log and then like little snippets about the calls. Is that the one you're referring to? Let me see. So this was kind of the week ending template, but then there was like- It was from the public, public yeah, records request. From your public records request. So there was, I think it got more and more, you know, as it, as I think March was when it ended, but I think March was kind of the, where it had, where is it? So there was, there was a part where, Let's see, there was a breakdown. Oh, like this, I guess. This mm -hmm. was the week ending. Does this have, yeah. So this had some of the kind of racial demographics and age and. Um... So some of the things, some of the difficulty is, is that um, when we do racial identity and everything else, a lot of times we're doing it on phenotype by what you see. Mm -hmm. So what one person perceives as someone's race is not necessarily what they are. And it really takes like time to build a relationship to be able to ask that kind of question. Um, and as we're going through, those are the type of things that we're trying to build into our, um, our uh, paperwork is just trying to figure out how we can do this in a way that is still um, trauma-informed. Because we don't want to be seeming like we're in there um, investigating someone. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, or using that information to target somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And because it makes a difference. Right. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think just kind of working in the field and doing like these quick assessments, they're like, why are you asking me this question? And either mm -hmm. it's like, it's obvious, like, why are you, you know, like shut up or or like, you know. Well, I was going to say for some people, it's obvious for others, not at all. Right. I can tell you right now, you look at my family, you'd never guess. But this was to say, I think having some sort of kind of like structured report, if it's if you're still able to produce something like this would be helpful for us to kind of see like, oh, wow, there were a hundred collaborations with the rec department last month. Or... And that is the type of information we're trying to gather to yeah. work with um, Qualtrics to form our responder form so that we have a better idea of who we are serving mm -hmm. um, and what areas and the times, et cetera. So really trying to narrow down all this information that you're seeing there and make it, you know, in a very digestible way. But again, one of the problems with Qualtrics was, is that they started um, really working on it. I think the same week I started, which was April 8th. So everything, and then with the end of the year and all the other stuff that's come up, you know, we've kind of put a pause to that to give time to finish out um, our grants, et cetera, because that's very important. Um, and to be able to have a really good handle on what it is we're actually looking for, because I've come in with some different ideas than uh, Crest 1.0 and Crest 2.0. Lisette, do you have any questions or comments that you wanted to share? Hi, Allegra. Hi. Um, no, not at this time. I guess it's not a it's more of a common with um, 
correct only because it seems like there's ex situations where there's many places, types of calls, and then you have types of calls that are youth and in the event that crest is needed because but that, you know, we keep going in and out. We keep missing some of the words. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the best signal. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry, I don't have the best signal, but I, I was pretty much saying I don't really have a comment or question at this time. I know I did come into the meeting late um, for certain reasons, but I guess I'm just a little bit confused with Cress because there's like extreme situations that it's needed, such as the mental health crisis types of phone calls um, that are non-violent, but then there's also the youth empowerment types of calls in the event that Cress is needed because I guess they don't want to contact the police department or it's better to have Cress there than the police department. So um, that's really it. I don't really have any questions. Thank you. I'm trying to that's not the one. I'm gonna try and share. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Did I lose you? Oh, my goodness. We'll, we'll definitely, while you're looking for that, just to okay. kind of Okay, you found it? No, thank you. I'm like trying to figure out why I can't see folks. Oh, there's why. No, I was just going to say that um, when when we have our next meeting with uh, Pamela next month, it's just to, to really kind of hone in more on the, the youth empowerment and where things stand um, or whether we'll need to pose some of these questions to Paul. Because, you know, Camille, you did say that, I guess, Park and Recreation is looking at a feasibility study for um, establishing the center, and there's the $500,000, so we need to kind of move on that to see where things stand. Okay, so I'm sharing with you some of, like, the call origins for the weeks, the office walk-ins, and this is for May. You can see some of the reports for the week of 5-6. There were 25 reports, 25 um, interactions, and 133 resources. So when you say resources, does that mean kind of resources given to a person like, hey, here's where you can go for a food bank? or Right. Those are different things that we offer. Okay. So as you can see, again, a lot of the things we are getting is more of the phone calls, the town agencies, um, assisting businesses. The one that's called Origin Town Department, what does that mean? It means any of the town departments that call us. So say um, the DPD, DPW calls us about... Um, an unhoused person in, say, the garages, um, things like that. Or somebody's on the steps or somebody's in town hall or um, trying to think. Somebody on the side. Was there somebody on the side of the police department? No, that was town hall. But something like this is actually very helpful, you know, like we were able to, to see 
you know, the cycle report, because obviously like even like, you know, just looking at it in terms of this patch, um, you know, there was two, you know, just kind of seeing, you know, hopefully that increases with time and things like that and where the calls are coming from and the types of calls and, and things like that. I think that's, that's very helpful. And that's the beauty of it is that everything that we're doing now, we are really, really working on how do we want to make this better? Mm -hmm. This is good to see. So. So I'm just looking at our agenda and I'm thinking it doesn't seem like there's much more on the Resident Oversight Board or Youth Empowerment Center. Um, should we move to our second public comment section? Yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone... Well, yeah. well Actually, where where does uh, other topics like those that we didn't reasonably anticipate in forty eight hours? Usually, I think we do it at the at very the end. end. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Then yeah. Then let's do a public comment. Then. All right. So, if anybody else would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Hi, this is Martha Hanner, live in South Amherst, and uh, very interesting to hear all about the latest things from Chris and good questions that you're uh, asking. It seems like good progress. I, I just want to uh, extend the invitation to, to you folks and anyone who is listening that uh, the League is going to be hosting a welcome reception for the whole community on June 30th up at Mill River from 2.30 to 4.30 to welcome Camille and hopefully uh, many of the crest responders will be able to come and also welcome uh, Chief Ting and let everyone in the community have the chance to get acquainted, you know, meet and greet one-on-one -on -one, uh, and discuss and again emphasize the crest and our police department are two uh, independent, both important departments that uh, collaborate and uh, so on, as you've heard tonight. But everyone is very welcome to attend, and we hope it will be an opportunity for people uh, to just meet and greet and get acquainted. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, because uh, uh, probably the next meeting will be after Juneteenth has passed, but to really um, uh, invite you all to have a great uh, and wonderful Juneteenth, um, particularly if you can, please uh, join us on um, the 19th itself uh, in uh, Mill River um, Recreational Area. <clears throat> the Black Business Association of the Amherst uh, area will be gathering there as uh, in recognition of the 15th annual uh, Amherst Juneteenth Jubilee organized in the community since 2010. That's one to four um, and uh, really invite you all to, to come out and, uh, and let us honor you and thank you for the wonderful work you're doing in developing this new community safety vision, new community safety model. Um, and finally, I just would say, um, I'll be speaking there a bit on reparations. And I want folks to know that uh, we talk about in different lanes, you know, Crest, youth empowerment, all of these that came out of the community safety working group um, vision, these are independent and yet interrelated. 
with the process of reparations, Black reparations and reparative justice. It's independent, but it's interrelated. And so we we uh, uh, really hope to share more on where the process is in Amherst, as well as part of the whole national movement on Juneteenth, one to four, uh, uh, Wednesday at the uh, Mill River Recreation Area. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Greetings, this is Evelyn Aquino, and I am calling. I would love to see if we can start to create common language. I hear youth empowerment kind of thrown around in very different ways, programming to keep them from summer learning loss, that's youth empowerment, or having press create programming. But really, that youth empowerment, at the heart of it, was creating an avenue for young people to have access to leadership opportunities, to education opportunities, and to really be part of the fabric of the city or the town um, in terms of understanding their perspective. This is not, it was never created to be a social service, to be of service to them, but for them to be of service to the community, for an opportunity for them to grow and have a voice and have power to create change and to give perspective on the different bodies um, and committees in the city. So I would love, as we're moving forward, to really get to the bottom of understanding what that common language of what is youth empowerment. And it's not sort of a babysitting kind of service of just yeah. keeping them busy and off the street, that um, that we're really thinking about that as an avenue of leadership and opportunity to, for young people to have agency and to be part of the solutions that we need in the city. Um, and the second comment that I wanted to ask is, about the representation of the CREST members. I really look forward to having um, members of the CREST not having to use a tool or a translator, but that is, you know, when we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about words and language, we're talking about culture and lived experience of the diversity of the city, of this town. Um, that is very important and, and partly because many of the community members have relationships within the enclaves of, of the various, um, cultural and ethnic communities um, that exist. So I just didn't want that to get sort of over the past that it's about translating a language. It's about the building of community and community being part of the community and young people seeing themselves in the members of CREST. So it's beyond just words and, and translation. And, um, and also the, when we, um, Camille, you mentioned on several occasions the veteran population that I know is incredibly um, of need in our community, in particular homelessness and, and some of the um, other issues that we see them suffering with in our own community. But I also want to highlight that um, CREST was also uh, one of the opportunities that we were looking to address was the community of color. Um, that were not included or that were challenged by the police responses um, when when things were nonviolent and needed to be addressed, but and instead escalated. So I'm hoping that those also become examples that are used when we're talking about press moving forward um, as communities that we're looking and the gaps that we're looking to fill around um, filling the needs of this community. Thank you. Very That's much. it for now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Walker. Um, I am an Amherst Town Counselor, but speaking on behalf of myself, I am also the former co-chair of the CSWG. Um, and so first, I just wanted to thank you all so much for the important and challenging work that you are doing for our town. I just can't stress how critically important that this work really is for the health of our entire community. Um, and I want to just give an, a special recognition and shout out to Deborah for just her continued perseverance in this. And, you know, I think she mentioned, I'm sorry, I came to the meeting a bit late, but I think she mentioned that it's been years that she's been engaging with this exact topic. Um, and I think that 
Um, Deborah, thank you so much. You have been an amazing community leader and advocate for our community. And I just listening to you even tonight and every time I, I tune into one of these meetings, just listening to how clear and concise you are about the issues and how you stay on point and bring it full circle and that you're always very mindful of making sure that community voices who aren't necessarily able to be present at these meetings are still being represented at these meetings. Um, and I think that that is an invaluable, like you are playing an invaluable role um, in this work. And I am extremely disappointed in the decision of our town manager to not reappoint you. Um, and I'm hoping that with some rallying and support from the community that that might be reconsidered um, because I think it would be a tremendous loss for our community, specifically our BIPOC and marginalized community members. Um, so I did just want to start there. And then um, I think both Dr. Shabazz and Evelyn touched really eloquently on what I was going to say, so I won't keep you too long. But I just really want to stress that when the CSWG was looking at what recommendations we could hand to the town, we were studying the issues of public safety and specifically what services were being delivered by the Amherst Police Department that could be outsourced to a different department. And we came up with a number of different recommendations. And like Dr. Shabazz says, they're separate, of course, interconnected because they came out of the same study for the same need, community needs or deficit of the, the community needs that are not being met. But youth empowerment was never something we talked about as being performed by CRESS. Um, and so I think that that's a little bit, not that I'm not, don't want to see CRESS engaging with the youth, not that I don't think it's important for CRESS as opposed to the APD to be working with students, especially in a school setting. But the main goal of CRESS is not youth empowerment. We hope that to be a whole entirely separate and equally as important avenue that the town might hopefully get started on soon. Um, and so I'm really hoping that CRESS can really focus on being the alternative to the APD. And that is the main purpose. And the goal was to serve those community members who are falling through the cracks, who are our BIPOC and marginalized community members, whose, whose safety is not prioritized by the APD. Um, and who doesn't feel safe or trusting of the APD and they still need to be taken care of and they still need to be able to call and get emergency services at all times of the day. Um, and so I just really want to remind you and I know Camille that, that I'm sure you've done this but just in case that I really encourage you to look at the origin of CRESS and like what we were asked to do and how we came up with the creation for CRESS because I think that says a lot more than what is actually happening right now. And I know we're young and we're getting things started. And I think that, you know, we're taking the steps that need to be taken and I'm grateful for that. But I really would love to see some caution in making sure that the actions of Cress are still central to the goal um, and that we're not training for things that we won't need in the future. Um, I hope that you know, we can really start doing the same trainings that the police are doing because that's what we want Crest to be doing. Um, so again, I just, I thank you all for your work. It's incredibly important. I really, I'm really advocating for you, Deborah. I really am so grateful for your work and I'm excited to see what changes and new thoughts and new ideas you bring, Camille. And I'm hopeful that there will be a continued working relationship between CRESS and DEI and the CSSJC um, and that we can really make sure that we're focusing on the community members who are not always represented um, in this level of government. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Walker. So, um, Pat Anani Bakwe again, I was one of the original members of CS. WG, and my public comment is about the DEI department. I was the one actually who suggested having DEI department through my private conversations with Dr. D. Shabazz. May her so rest in peace, uh, who, whose company was consult consultant to CSWG. 
the idea was to have DEI department, bike park cultural center, and youth empowerment center. Meaning that the DEI department would be in charge of youth empowerment center, period. Our recommendations were accepted by the town council and the town manager, it was presented to the town council. And now that is back door to change the whole thing. My, our group CSWG, which Deb was also a member, we were very clear that those programs must be run by the town. All this stuff of busy work, getting press responders to be involved in youth service uh, program is not what we envision. So it needs to stop, basically. We need, you know, we need to put pressure on the town council and the town manager to go back to the recommendations that was made by CSWG. I'm getting very impatient and frustrated. It's been since 2021 that we make that suggestion. In fact, the youth that served on CSWG, Darius Cage, gave a lot of ideas. He even interviewed you know, some of his peers. He did research and what they would like to see is a center where they can, you know, have leisure activities, career development, whatever, you know, name it. Have mentor mentorship. It's been very, you know, several years and nothing is happening, just spinning the wheel, spinning the wheel. It's very disrespectful for the BIPOC community in our town that anything that impacts us is, is highly, not a priority. So Camille, just quickly, my comment is that I'm glad you said you're reaching out to different uh, uh, groups and residents in our town. And I'm kind of like perplexed why you have not reached out to CSWG. I know that group disbanded officially, but our group is still strong. We're still connected. We're still, we still communicate. You have not reached out to my, to my group. Also, I am the president of Black Business Association of Amherst Area. And I know you are new, but we're here to stay. We play a very good role in this town and nobody is going to make us disappear. We're here to stay to be strategic partners, whoever is willing to work with us. And we have to run the ship. It has to be on our own terms. And so please, when you're reaching out to, to different groups, also remember to make sure that you reach out to people who may not always you know, agree with our town government. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Yeah. I definitely wanted to say something about reaching out to folks. Um, I've been transparent and um, going to different meetings and uh, different events. And the people have come to the events that I've been at. I've given them my card. Um, Allegra and Deborah, you know that I reached out to everybody on the CSSJC and asked for one on one meetings. And in the bottom of my emails, there is a link to book appointments with me. So pretty much one of the things that's been happening is that I have been meeting people nonstop um, in the two months that I've been here. So while um, I would love to reach out to everyone, I've already made it very clear that anyone that is interested in reaching out to me and making an appointment, um, I have hours and I've been finding ways, meet somebody for coffee, tea or whatnot, just to have a conversation. I'm able to be meet uh, Deborah, we met over Zoom, Allegra, we met in person. So um, I'm eager to hear what the community has to say. 
And I was speaking to people Monday night at the town hall meeting. So I am very available for people to come talk to. Um, and I just want to say directly to Ms. Pat that you actually were one of the people that I was recommended to talk to. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't overstep by getting your number from someone else. So as I've said, I'm open, I'm ready, and um, I'm looking forward to meeting more people and finding out what else this community needs. And I am solution focused. So if someone comes to me and says, you know, there's this, I want to work together and figure out how are we going to get it done? So, so come to me with solutions. I'm ready. I'm all ears and ready to do the work. Thank you, Camille. Um, I am not seeing any other hands up. And so I know our next meeting is, oh, there's one more hand. <laughs> doo -doo. Hi, I just but want mean, to also share with you that we can't that hear you. much of what we are looking to do is, oh. this is, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, definitely better. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that one of the issues that was being covered this whole working group and community work is disengaged so in your position of telling the people to come that's a pro process that takes time to build trust and i yes. met you i met you at the tournament um hero award this weekend it was good to see you out but when you're in a position like yourself addressing this particular um issue of you you have to go to where the people are the church has a large Latino population. The Cambodian population, uh, many of them at the temple. The housing complexes are incredibly diverse. So I would just encourage you to go to where the people are because when we do this work, telling the people to come to us before that trust is built, before they know who we are, um, just doesn't usually give us the, the results that we're looking for. Putting up a flyer, we have a community meeting, does not engage a community that already feels disengaged, that's already used to them not being a priority. So I would just encourage you, if you want to ask people, where are the people so you can go there, we're more than willing to share that with you. But that takes time to build that trust before they start coming to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. I 100% agree with building trust and meeting people where they're at. And right now, what's been going on in the two months that I've been here is a lot of groundwork. Um, I've been going to a lot of events and meeting people. And it, again, as you said, it takes time. It takes time for people, for me to get to know people and people to get to know me. So yes, I 100% agree that getting out there is very important. And that is something that I am doing. Um, I'm only one person and you know, there's only so many hours in a day. And literally I came to work, I'm still in my office and I've been here since 7.30 this morning. So um, I get it, you know, but I'm committed. I think that I've shown that I'm very committed to um, press, I'm committed to the vision and the cause and to the people. And as a black woman, um, an educated black woman and first generation, you know, I'm a lot of firsts and I am all about building community and bringing people together. Glenn. So our next meeting will be July 10th. It's a Wednesday. Um, and Chief Ting is joining us for that meeting. So perhaps if we want to have a list of questions or agenda 
you know, within the agenda items for him. We can do that via everybody emailing me and Deb. <laughs> I think yeah. so. I mean, that's uh, the only way we can do it. Yeah. So I'm having a vague memory of us trying to choose a date for a forum. Did that really happen the last time we met? Because if so, yeah, we, I did, we discussed having them in the fall. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we, we haven't, uh, because we discussed that, that would probably be better in the fall than in the summer, because obviously with vacations and different things, it'll be too much, okay. but I think, uh, maybe at our next meeting, maybe we can discuss dates and where we might want to do it because mm -hmm. probably the mid September, early October mm -hmm. might be a good time period for us to have these town forums and to go to, um, the places like what our last, um, Carla said, right, we we're going to different community areas as opposed to having um, community members come to us. We need to go to where the community's at. So we just need to identify those, get that from, from the community so that we can uh, put those dates in place. Yeah. Okay, so that will be on our agenda for next time. Deborah, mm -hmm. did you have something that we didn't have on the agenda that hadn't come up before? Yeah, um, the thing that I wanted to bring up because I, I noticed wasn't on the agenda and, you know, I didn't realize it until like, yeah, like today or maybe last night when I was reminding um, folks to, to attend today um, is around the, the school budget. Uh, do we have any uh, updates on that where things stand? Um, because hey. again, I, and we touched upon it, right? I think a lot of what Cress is trying to do in terms of stopgap, which is my concern and and you know, making sure that Crest kind of stays focused on its mission is to help because right now the schools don't have the budget, right? So do we know where things stand? Because I've heard a variety of different things that really right now it was it, it should have been an 8% budget and only 6% was approved. So there would still be a deficit. So I'm so concerned that some of those positions are going to be lost. So do you have any any idea, Allegra? So I do believe that the Amherst Finance Committee did uh, you know, recommend the 6%, which mm -hmm. would still mean that there would be some cuts. So I yeah. don't know, based on the 6%, what is being proposed as cuts. Mm -hmm. Um. Is there anyone that maybe we could invite, you know, can we put that on the agenda for the next time and maybe see if we can invite someone that might have that information, maybe even someone from the school committee um, that that could come in and present to us? Because obviously that this is that's a critical issue, okay. right? Our, our, our schools that are the ones we talk a lot about the youth, right? And making sure that we're giving um, the youth the wherewithal to be the leaders, not of tomorrow, but of today. So therefore, you know, I think this would be very important for us to see where things are at, because like I said, I keep getting a lot of, of, of different information, um, but if there's still a deficit, that means there's going to be positions cut. And obviously I'm very concerned that that will mean, you know, BIPOC positions being cut, um, you know, students that are uh, uh, BIPOC and marginalized, not getting the services that they need. Um, and again, continuing with these cuts where we know there's been cuts continually within our schools for years. Um, so maybe we might want to add that and then find someone to, to come present to us. That sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. And Councilwoman Walker, if you have any corrections to what I'm about to say, you can raise your hand and you can correct me. But I believe that is the vote on the budget the week of June 24th? Um, which the 24th is the Monday of that week. So I don't know. Usually town council meets on Mondays. And there is nothing posted yet. And I'm not seeing any hands up. So I believe that's the week that they're voting because I think it has to be approved by the 30th so that the fiscal year will start with a budget on July 1. Um, so not seeing Alicia's hand up to correct me. I'm going to hope that I'm correct. Um, 
And if I'm incorrect, I can at least let committee members know via email. Um, but yes, it is important that that continues to be a point of advocacy for this committee and the community at large, um, especially around some of the positions that were being proposed to be cut. My, yeah, I, I don't have a good sense of what is still going to be potentially lost from the schools. Just difficult, right? Because that means people's livelihoods and things like that. And I and I have talked to some community members whose jobs are on the chopping block. And obviously it's it's very uncomfortable, you know, mm -hmm. for them to be in, in the position that they're in. Yeah. Um, not only for them, but also for our community in terms of our students that are of course going to be impacted mm -hmm. if those positions um get um extinguished. Absolutely. Uh, anything else? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that we can close the meeting then at 9.03. Um, and we will see hopefully everybody next month, June 10th, July 10th. <laughs> okay. At least I know I'll be able to be here at least for the next few months, but hopefully by next month, I'll have some clarity in terms of my appointments. Correct. I, I really because hope. this month-to-month -month situation is not going to work. No. <laughs> it's not, it's untenable and not sustainable. Thanks, Deborah, you. Thank is, you. Is that your appointment to this particular committee? Yes. Yeah, you missed it, Lis Lisette, because I did a whole thing in regards to, I'll send you the emails that I've been communicating with uh, Paul Bockelman and the town council and Lynn and everyone in regards to it. But basically, yeah, my appointment ends at the end of this month and Paul des decided that he's not going to reappoint me for a second term. So uh, retaliatory and um, uh, behavior on his end. So we're figuring that out. As of right now, though, I can continue on for a few more months. So I'm trying to clarify to make sure that he reappoints me for two years, a second term. Okay. Um, I look forward to your email. Like if there's anything that we can do, please feel free to share because I think that you're definitely like a huge part of this committee and we would definitely be a bit of big loss if you don't get reappointed. Yes. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Next, Bye -bye. Week, next week. Have yep. a good night, folks. Good night.